When the chief said I'd be in Greece for a while, I was worried. My trench coat stains easily. So strap on your sandals and laurel wreaths for a Grecian field trip. country in southern Europe made up of over 1,400 islands. Imagine, that's 400 more islands than the salad dressing. Athens is the capital of Greece. Athens was home to one of man's earliest civilizations. Doesn't look too civilized to me. This place is in ruins. The ancient Greeks built their Finest monuments here, high atop the Acropolis. No wonder these buildings look like they need a rest. They've been standing for over 2,000 years. Boy, are their feet tired. Acropolis means uppermost city. They called it that because it's high up. This fortress was a safe place where the Greeks kept things worth defending, like treasures and statues that would later lose their wings and heads. The Athens Acropolis, aside from being a nifty spot for an impromptu game of hide-and-seek, is most famous for being the home of the Parthenon, the Temple of Athena Nike, the Aerathion, and Propylia. Each are impressive ancient monuments and all make excellent spelling bee questions. The people of ancient Greece believed that the gods and goddesses lived up here in the clouds and watched over the mortals' daily life. It was kind of like television for the gods. The Parthenon is a classic example of Doric architecture. Simple columns based on strict mathematical rules. The influence of Greek architecture can still be seen today in buildings all around the world, such as London's Buckingham Palace and the White House in Washington, D.C. Would you believe the Temple of Athena Nike was named after the goddess of fine footwear? Actually, it was named after the goddess of war and wisdom, Athena, who was also responsible for protecting the Acropolis. Another Acropolis monument, the Aerathion, celebrates the spot where Athena and Poseidon, god of the sea, battled over who would reign over the Acropolis. Guess who won? Athena. But she was so soaked her hair didn't hold a curl for 600 years. The building was named after the snake-bodied god Aretheus. Needless to say, he didn't get too many dates. These six graceful maidens supporting the porch are called the Caryatidas. They look like they have a lot on their minds, which is unusual, because most of these statues have rocks on their heads. 
wowzer. Look at the time. Walking these rooms sure hasn't ruined my appetite. Let's go to the marketplace and grab some Greek grub. The Greek gods tell me it's this way. Wowzers. Business is terrible. Doesn't look like we'll get a pita sandwich here. Back in the old days, this marketplace was called the Agora. It's where the people of Athens would gather for all their activities. Wait, I'm getting a top secret message from the chief. The Agora was once an important meeting place. Stop. Not anymore. Stop. Head north to shop and eat and don't stop. Go, go, gadget copper. Just as I suspected, the modern day Athens flea market where fleas and uh, Athenians come to meet, greet, and eat. Time for an Inspector Gadget field trip fact. The surfaces of the Parthenon were intentionally built with a slight angle. That's because straight lines look bent when viewed from a distance. The Greeks figured out that curved lines would look straight from afar. So if you want to look straight, curve your back. If you want to look curved, straighten up. Hope you wore your hip boots. My gadget map tells me that even though there are more than 1,400 islands in Greece, people live on only about 160 of them. Go, go, gadget copter. Would you believe for centuries the sea has been a major part of Grecian life? The Greeks became top-notch shipbuilders and got around in boats like these. Only theirs moved and weren't just pictures. Today, locals and tourists alike island hop on ferries like these. The Greeks have so much water, this boat needs a pool to hold some of it. And if you don't like the ferry, you can hitch a ride on a blue dolphin. Not that one. This blue dolphin is a hydrophore, a faster ferry that travels on top of the water between islands. Five of the most visited islands in Greece are Mykonos, Paros, Noxos, Eos, and Amorgos. That's a lot of oceans. First stop, Mykonos. Mykonos is possibly the best known of all the Greek islands. Its semicircular harbor, whitewashed houses, and picturesque windmills have drawn more tourists than any other island. I never knew buildings could draw. Greek beaches attract windsurfers from all over the world. There are thousands of beaches on the islands, and they offer something for everyone, if you like sand. On Eos, the beach is the place to meet and greet, to see and be seen. Or, if you like your privacy, how about a stretch of sand all to yourself? At Columbipress Beach, on the island of Paros, you can even swim alongside giant rock formations. The rock formations are notoriously slow swimmers. You'll never know who you'll meet on the beach, but your best friend will be your sunscreen. When the sun goes down, the visitors invade the narrow streets in search of food, fun, dance, and that donkey from the beach. While the tourists whoop it up, the locals scoop it up with fish nets. The harbor of Nasa on Paros is home to a typical Greek fishing village. Where there's a typical Greek fishing village, there's a typical Greek cat waiting to make fish head souvlakis.
Greek fishermen use boats called trehondiri that have a rounded bow and stern. Many catch their fish with nets called carteri, which they drop down to the sea floor to trap small tuna and bonito. They've been doing it this way for thousands of years, and the fish still haven't caught on. Just off the tip of Paros is the smaller island of Andi Paros. Known for its dark, eerie stalactite caves, a stalactite is made up of calcium carbonate deposits hanging from the roof of the cave. The caves stretch a hundred meters down into the earth and have been visited by queens. On the island of Naxos lies a giant unfinished stone statue. Locals call this 2,700-year-old sleeping giant the Greek. Hey, if you were 2,700 years old, you'd be lying down too. And now an Inspector Gadget field trip back. Greece is less than one-third the size of the state of California in the United States. But Greece has 9,385 miles of coastline. That's more than 10 times the size of the California coastline. Go figure. Looks like our captain is ready to hoist the sail, trim the mast, shiver the timbers, and pipe up to the poop deck. Which means he's leaving. And without me. Wait up! Next stop, Amorgos. Amorgos is less visited than the other Greek islands, probably because it's so far east. In the coastal harbor town of Egali, you can unwind and wet your whistle at one of the many outdoor tavernas. The main port is a colorful harbor town, Katapoulos. Katapoulos still relies on the traditional mode of island transportation. No, not blue dolphins, donkeys. The jewel of Amorgos is the breathtaking monastery. It's called Hozo Diotiza, and it's literally wedged into the cliffs above the sea. The locals call it the Eagle's Nest. Go, go, Gadget Copter! This eagle lives a pretty good life. Inside are priceless treasures which are ornamented with precious stones not to mention some pretty strong talons to grab gadget copters with. Next up, the island of Lesbos. Lesbos is known for its beautiful harbors, acres of olive trees, and its yellow waterfall. Wait a minute, that's not water, that's olive oil. Let's explore. The olive tree has long been a symbol of joy, peace, and victory for the people of Greece. The first tree was a gift from the goddess Athena, and Greek agriculture has been floating in a sea of olive oil ever since. They use it for everything. After all, the slippery business of live tree farming is still the most traditional and widespread form of agriculture in Greece today. Olive trees live to a ripe old age. This olive tree, standing near a road called the Sacred Way, is said to be over 2,000 years old. But it could be lying about its age. But with my keen detective sense, I can usually root out the liars. I'm no sap. On average, modern Greece produces more than 250,000 tons of olive oil a year. Why, just on the island of Lesbos, there are over 11 million olive trees. Today's special machines are also used to tickle the branches so they won't break. Large nets are placed underneath to collect the olives. The process is quicker and more enjoyable than smacking the tree. For the tree, that is. After collection, the olives are put in canvas sacks so they can breathe. Their life may be the pits, but olives are living organisms. From here, they are quickly sent to the oil pressing factory. 
The olives are then sorted to get rid of the leaves and stems, washed, and put into the presser. The presser is like a big egg beater that crushes the olives into a paste until the oil is squeezed out. Another machine separates the solid paste from the oil. Without this machine, this job would be the pits. Oh yes, the pits are processed at other plants. Some are actually converted into fuel. After the water is separated out, the golden olive oil is ready. Wowzers, the Greek people are also known for their colorful and lively dancing, some of which dates back 2,000 years. Three popular Greek dances are the Zambekiko, or the Drunk Sailor's Dance, the Sirto, or Circle Dance, and the Tamiko, where men can show off in the middle of the circle. These Greeks can really bust a move. And now, an Inspector Gadget field trip back. Greek athletes in the ancient Olympics were known to cover their bodies with olive oil after bathing to soothe their ailing muscles. That explains why they were naked. Their clothes kept slipping off. Would you believe these gods are part of the Greek Olympic marching team? Actually, we're at the tomb of the unknown soldier. These elite gods are called Evzenes. And between their fancy high stepping, they watch over the tomb by standing perfectly still. The Amazoness may not know who the soldier is, but they may know the way to the stadium of the unknown athletes. Let's step along. Wowzers! Olympia, home of the Greek gods and the most famous site of the ancient Olympic Games. It's recorded that the Olympic Games were held here since 776 BC. Let's get a gadget's eye view of this historic place. The Games were held to honor the god of all gods, Zeus. Athletes came from all parts of the Greek Empire bearing gifts. But what do you give the god who has everything? How about giving a god his own temple? The Temple of Zeus was one of the largest in Greece and once stood here. Now only ruins of this great temple remain. Wonder what they did with the rest of it. Let's face it, they don't make temples like they used to. Athletes walk from the temple down this path under the arch and into the Olympic Stadium. Not that different from the stadiums we enter today. Except the hot dogs are a lot fresher. Wowzers, another top secret Inspector Gadget field trip back. The Olympic Games were held here for more than 1,000 years until they were banned by Emperor Theodosius in 394 AD. Among other things, he objected to the Olympic clothing, mainly the fact that they weren't wearing any. It seems the athletes competed in the nude. Many original Olympic events are still held today. Wrestling, running, the long jump, and the discus throw. A discus weighed as much as 15 pounds, and athletes threw them as far as they could. This is the site of the gymnasium where athletes trained for events that took up a lot of room, like the javelin throw, long distance running, and bobbing for statues. As you can see, the place has run itself into the ground. The maintenance man has been on vacation since the year 2 BC. As important as the Olympics were to the Greeks, women were not allowed to compete. In fact, they couldn't even watch. But a few may have peeked through the pillar at opening day ceremonies. According to my keen detective sense, the women got even. They held their own games every four years to honor the goddess, Hera, who was Zeus's wife. 
Bet she was glad to get down from the Olympian Heights once in a while. You can bet the first woman's Olympics got those male athletes off their bare ducks. Here at the Temple of Era, the Olympic flame is still lit today. And small wonder, after those smoldering beginnings, how do we know so much about the Greeks? My extraordinary bionic investigation skills. That and the fact that the Greeks left their literature and art lying around everywhere. Paintings on vases, tools, statues, armor, and other artifacts that can be seen in museums. Well, I hope you had fun exploring the Acropolis, idly ambling through Athens, island hopping with the dancing donkeys, and doing the decathlon on Olympia. Till next time, remember, if you go after your dreams like an Olympic athlete, you'll always score a perfect 10. Go, go, gadget field trip. Peek.